Since the very first episode, I've talked off and on at points about ransomware and the big problems they can cause. In fact, we already talked about this one piece of ransomware called WannaCry back in earlier episodes, but I think it deserves its own full episode given the scope of how big it was from start to finish. You probably remember it as that big virus that took down the National Health Service, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the background and what went into making this whole thing possible. I'm John Cordes, and today I'm going to take you back to 2017, and we're going to talk about what the shell WannaCry is, but more importantly, we're going to take you back to how it was able to make as big an impact as it did by exploring what helped it to propagate its way across the internet. So, before we get into the episode, I want to take a quick second to tell you about something that I think is pretty exciting. If you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen me posting that I've gone ahead and tested some items from an online store that I was hoping I could offer to you. Well, they're here. If you want a What the Shell t-shirt, hat, sticker, or a patch or something like that, you can get one at store.whattheshellpod.com. I did my best to try to offer something that I'd wear out in both the show's traditional logo and the Wireless Rebellion logo. So, if that's something you think you'd be interested in, go take a look. Again, it's store.whattheshellpod.com, or I'll put a link down in the description. Alright, back to the episode. I know I just said we're going to talk about WannaCry, but to do that, we need to understand the lead-up to it, and how all the pieces came together in a perfect storm of disaster. We know that WannaCry was the product of the Lazarus Group, that group being an Advanced Persistent Threat, or APT, that operates out of North Korea. Their primary goals seem to be state-sponsored cyber espionage and attacks that'll make money for the North Korean government. If you want to know more about them and their inner workings, I do have an entire episode on that as well. That's a good enough idea about the who of this story. So we're going to take another step back and give a little bit of a recap as to what ransomware actually is for a bit of a primer today. You've all probably heard of it in one way or another at this point. It's pretty hard to ignore given just how many different kinds of ransomware there are and how often they tend to make the news now. To put it simply, ransomware is a piece of malware that will encrypt every file on your computer or file share. Only the people who control the ransomware have the decryption keys for this. So what do they do? They hold it hostage. Typically, that means that accompanying the encryption of all your files, you'll probably see some kind of note demanding a form of payment, likely in cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin, in exchange for the key to decrypt your files. An analogy for that might be like a thief breaking into your house while you're gone. Only, instead of stealing the contents of your house, he decided to lock every door and every window with keys that only he had. And when you got home, there'd be a note taped to the front door saying to leave some cash in exchange for the new keys to get in. In both situations, you've got a couple options. You can either abandon the computer, or, as it were, the house, and start over with a blank slate. That might seem like it's a bit overkill, but let's talk about the second option before we jump to that point. The second option is that you pay off the criminal and they give you the keys. The big fear here is that you need to be 100% certain that you know how they got in, that they're still not somewhere else you haven't looked, and that they'll actually hold up their end of the bargain after you pay them. After all, a thief in this situation could just keep the keys. These are criminals we're dealing with after all, so it's not surprising to know that sometimes they'll come back and re-encrypt your files, keep a foothold in your network, or just lie and take your money. Now, ransomware organizations do have a bit of a reputation to upkeep. After all, they don't want it out there that they typically run and dump with your files. There is a bit of a third option that lies between those two, but requires you to have a responsible and capable information security program. That option is backups. A backup is a snapshot of a device as it was in a specific point in time. A lot of programs will capture this weekly, meaning that... If you can find out when the attacker got in, you could theoretically use the last backup before they got on and only lose the gap between then and now. Not every program has a solid backup procedure, and it requires a lot of care, attention, and testing, but it's probably the best method to ensure that you're not just replacing a whole lot of computers and starting from scratch. So, a minute ago, 
I talked to you about how you need to make sure the attacker is gone from your network too. That's because ransomware is just a part of a formula that results in a payout for them. There's still the matter of the initial break-in, so to speak. A hacker or a hacking group needs an exploit or a way in to start the whole process. There's a whole market revolving around those exploits. Hackers and researchers will spend countless hours looking at code and systems trying to find ways they could wriggle their way in or to escalate their permissions from a normal account into admin level access. If you're doing this legally, they're often referred to as bug bounties. Many companies have specific test criteria and test instances that you can use and they'll pay you if you find a bug in their tools. When I was researching this, I was pretty surprised to learn that one of the first companies that did this was actually Netscape. You know, the dial-up internet platform way back in 1995? It caught on a lot more in the mid-2000s, but now there's thousands and thousands of companies doing this. I myself have done bug bounties before. It's not super lucrative, but it's interesting. But why would a company do that? Well, in some cases, it can be more cost-effective. You're essentially outsourcing security to the public, and the cost for that vulnerability and paying out the hacker who found it so that you can patch it is likely less than the repercussions of it going the other way. If a malicious hacker had found and exploited it, not only would you potentially have a fiscal loss in the way of fines, machine replacement, man hours, but the company would have a reputational loss. If we look at payouts just last year, Google paid one researcher $157,000 after they found a major security issue in the Android operating system. Now, I know I just gave a big number, but the thing you need to understand here is that this is in the upper echelon of payouts. So that's not the normal. The average bug bounty payout, according to PopSci.com, is just about $250. Those are for low-level vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities with a lower payout were likely easier to find, less extreme vulnerabilities that maybe required a very specific circumstance to be exploited, but were still noteworthy enough that they felt like they deserved a little bit of money for the bug bounty. But my point is, that's the range we're working with here if you're doing bug bounty legally. But my point here is that there's a big gap between the small and the large in terms of bug bounties. From $250 to six figures. And that's just if you're going about it legally. There are other groups willing to pay even more for exploits that haven't been revealed. Those exploits that haven't been revealed are called zero days. The kind of people that would pay out big bucks for exploits like this might be criminals, nation states like the United States, China, Russia, and even North Korea. Those groups can get away with payouts that are orders of magnitude greater than their corporate counterparts. Why? Well, think about it from a government perspective here. If someone posts on the dark web that they have an exploit against a popular operating system or tool that hasn't been patched anywhere yet, what could an intelligence agency do with that kind of power? That's why, if you're on the dark web, you'll often see notes that read like this. And you can see this note that I'm about to read on the transcript at whattheshellpod.com. The note read, Hello, I buy the zero-day vulnerabilities. It is possible to purchase one day in some cases. Money is always available. It goes on to list some of the payouts, too. For example, an operating system vulnerability that lets you go from a normal user to an admin would get you between thirty and seventy thousand dollars for Windows. It would get you between ten and fifty thousand dollars for Linux, and fifty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars for Macs. Those tend to be on the lower end of payouts because to do a privilege escalation like that, you need to already be on the network or the system. Usually, either for credentials you've gotten through phishing, or maybe you purchased them. But an initial foothold needs to happen. But for an easy-to-use exploit that lets you actually run commands right off the bat, well, those can pay up to a million dollars. Those are just operating system exploits, too. Browser hacks? Those are being offered from 100000 to half a million dollars, and there are payout offers from mobile apps as well. I encourage you to go to the website and take a look at this, because it's incredibly interesting. So, it's no surprise that a lot of hackers decide to go the less than legal route when you see payouts in the numbers like that. It does tend to put a bit of a target on your back though because this, again, is not necessarily legal. And if you take a step back even further, it's also no surprise that many countries don't necessarily want to do only payouts. Instead, they have their own teams of exploit researchers, and they'll try to poke holes wherever they can and use those for their advantage. 
And I want to pause here because surely you're wondering right now, hey, this is a WannaCry episode, where's WannaCry? Don't worry, it's coming. There's just a few more pieces that we need to set down to get to that. Remember, we're working in the time frame of 2016 and 2017. So let's take it back to then, because that's when one hacker group dubbed the Shadow Brokers decided that they had stuff that was worth the payout. In fact, they claimed they had the best cyber weapons made by the United States, going so far as to say that it was made by the NSA. In a public release hoping to get them a payout of around 1 million Bitcoin, 568 or so million dollars at the time, they said the following. We follow Equation Group traffic. We find Equation Group source range. We hack Equation Group. We find many, many Equation Group cyber weapons. You see pictures. We give you some Equation Group files free. You see. This is good proof, no? You enjoy. You break many things. You find many intrusions. You write many words, but not all. We are auction the best files. There might be a little disconnect here for you. At first I mentioned the NSA, now I'm talking about this equation group. Well, what the Lazarus group is to North Korea, the equation group is to the NSA. Just a name that's given to these APTs. And the equation group had a reputation as one of, if not the top, advanced threat actors out there. And if we examine this a little bit line by line, we can see what they're really saying is, they've followed the equation group traffic, They've been hacked, and they have allegedly in their possession some of the tools that the Equation Group uses as a part of their cyber attacks. When they say you see pictures, we give you some files free, that is referring to the fact that they are showing you pictures of some of the scripts, and they're giving you a little bit of a taste, some of the exploits. In this case, I believe at the time they were giving out firewall exploits. That was to lend a little bit of credence to the fact that this is legit and not just some elaborate hoax. And those exploits were for both American and Chinese firewalls. Researchers were pretty quick to respond to this, many of them taking a look at the exploits and determining that they looked incredibly legitimate. Over the coming months, August into early December, several of the companies impacted confirmed that these were unpatched vulnerabilities in their hardware. The Shadow Brokers had their hands on incredibly valuable exploits, and to give even more credence to the idea that this was all the NSA's tools and not just them playing around pointing fingers, they released a list of foreign servers that were allegedly compromised by the NSA as of Halloween 2016. That's like burning your spies. But when the auction failed to get what they wanted out of it, they started just straight selling the exploits on underground markets. Things came to a head with regard to our story on April 8th, 2017. On that date, the Shadow Brokers dumped a myriad of exploits to their GitHub page. And I've got the GitHub page linked in the transcript as well, so you can actually go ahead and take a look at them if you want. I'll add here that if you want to use any of the exploits, you can. Just use it in a test environment. Don't use it on any live equipment because that's illegal. There were a lot, and I mean a lot, of valuable and notable exploits here. But there's only one that we want with regards to this story. The key to making WannaCry work and that exploit was called Eternal Blue. That was the entry point. That was the way the thief could break into your house. The starting point for how things would snowball into full-blown chaos. Eternal Blue was an exploit that used a very common protocol in Windows in a way that allowed nearly full control of a host system if it was exploited correctly. That protocol was called SMBv1, or Server Message Block. It was developed in the early 80s as a way to easily share files across the network using a dedicated port. It does that by negotiating a bit of a connection between the client and the server that's being accessed and communicating a request on the designated port. Well, that's where the exploit would insert itself. Under certain conditions, a malicious version of those request packets could be forged, processed, and allowed resulting in the attacker being able to connect to the system and start getting to work spreading their malware. In this case, it would end up resulting in the spread of ransomware. Now remember, it's April 8th at this point, and something interesting happened about a month before this. Microsoft released a patch for that very issue. If you're a security researcher and you're looking at this, that might suggest that these exploits that were eventually released were tied to the United States. 
It's been suggested that the NSA, in an attempt to curb exploitation, alerted Microsoft of the issue so they could patch it before it got out as a part of a shadow brokers leak. So they knew that their tools were compromised and that this was legitimate, and I guess the mentality here was a bit of a mutually assured non-destruction. If this was going to get out into the world, the NSA would rather cut off their own limb and no longer be able to use the exploit effectively that they'd been using for quite a while. But one month probably wasn't enough time for this. Because either way, this is exactly what someone was waiting for to use to chain something dangerous to. Enter the Lazarus Group. We've talked about them before, and again, if you're interested, I suggest you go back and listen to either the Sony episode or the Lazarus episode that I've done, but long story short, we know they're affiliated to North Korea and they're aimed at making money, so they're going to tie an early version of the WannaCry ransomware to one of the tools, Eternal Blue, that the Shadow Brokers dumped. So you combine those two, and boom, now we've got a catastrophe on our hands. There did appear to be a catch, though. The Eternal Blue exploit primarily worked on older systems of Windows. Well, what are now older systems of Windows, anyways? WannaCry had to use early versions of Windows 7 and even some Windows XP systems to move around. But fortunately for the Lazarus group, there were plenty of those around in 2017. According to Statista, just 35% or so of the systems that occupied the Windows sphere were on Windows 10 at that point even though it had been out for two years. That left 65% of the Windows market to be targeted here. And here's the thing. There's no user interaction required to get this started. You just need to be able to see the computer on your network. So if you're a hacker looking at the internet, right now, in 2022, there are over 5 million Windows systems directly attached that I can see. I'm using a tool called Shodan to look this up. Shodan is this company that provides open source intelligence based on their own scanning of what's on the internet. And if I break it down even further, there are 600,000 of those machines with the SMB port open to the internet as well. You know, the port of a surface that's vulnerable here. If I really wanted to, I could filter it down by operating version and by SMB version, but that's a hefty amount of work. That's all to say that there's a large target base that someone could just start spamming with attacks right now, and even if just 1% of those machines responded, that's still 6,000 machines that I can now use as a foothold into their own network, and then start going after everything that isn't connected to the internet. So where might an attack like this hit the most heavily? Well, we're here. We're at WannaCry. I talked about it at the top of the episode. You probably remember it even if you don't know the full context of it, it hit the National Health Service for the UK. The first sightings of something strange happening occurred just after 3 in the morning Eastern Time, or 8 in the morning London Time, on Friday, May 12, 2017. Several institutions were reporting that they were getting locked out of their files, among them the NHS, which was specifically seeing computers being blocked, access to patient files being lost, and certain machines losing the ability to operate. If you walked in as an employee of the NHS, you probably saw a red window on your machine with a ransomware message. This transcript of the message, again, is on our website. It read, Oops, your files have been encrypted, and went on to offer some polite insight into what happened in the form of a simple FAQ section. It answered what happened to you. It explains that everything was locked and that they had the keys. It offered the solution to getting those keys. And in this case, that was paying $300 in Bitcoin. Then, it offered some instructions on how to pay that Bitcoin, and lastly, on the left, it explained that there's a time limit here. You have three days before the price doubles to $600, and seven days before the files are just gone forever. No recovery, do not pass go, do not collect $200. A small saving grace that some users might have noticed when they came in that day was that instead of this ransomware message, they were greeted with the blue screen of death. We've all seen it, it's all been a problem at some point in our lives, and here, that actually is the opposite case. It's because Eternal Blue had some issues on the newer version of Windows at the time, and instead of propagating and running the code that was built for this, the computer just crashed. If you were working in IT at the time, honestly at first it was probably a little bit scary, but it would end up being the only time you'd probably be relieved to see the blue screen of death show up. And... You might be thinking to yourself, how many machines could that possibly have been? 
We established that in 2017, Windows 10 had already been out for two years, so you'd think people would have time to upgrade, right? Maybe for your personal use, but it's not always the case. I worked in healthcare cybersecurity for about five years. There's a lot you need to consider when trying to upgrade something that big across an entire network. For instance, if you took a server or a workstation offline to do the upgrade, are you going to stop any programs that are running specifically for patients? What if the upgrade breaks those tools? How do you revert back? A lot of healthcare software can be years old because the hardware that it works on and in conjunction with is equally as old. And it's just difficult to find the time and money to update it without impacting a litany of hospital resources. So what happens instead? The risk is accepted and people keep going on about the day until something knocks the service over and you're forced to update it. That laissez-faire mentality happens far beyond just hospital infrastructure too, but unfortunately for the NHS, this was the day that they were the big fish. All in all, upwards of 300,000 devices were hit with that ransomware. In the UK alone, about 20,000 appointments needed to be cancelled, and it's estimated that it cost the NHS around 92 million pounds. It got so bad that for almost a week after this happened, the NHS was still using primarily paper documents, needing to abandon the digital format that had become standard at that point. So, how did WannaCry stop spreading? How did we get that bit of a light at the end of a tunnel here? Well, I'm going to kick it over to one security researcher by the name of Marcus Hutchins, because he is the one that figured out that something pretty weird was happening behind the scenes of the attack. After lunch on that Friday, on a day that Marcus was supposed to be off, he got home and noticed that on the fret sharing platform he used, that it was flooded with the news of a WannaCry impact on the NHS. In an article he wrote about the situation, he said, quote, Although ransomware on a public system isn't even newsworthy, systems being hit simultaneously across the country is. Contrary to popular belief, most NHS employees don't open phishing emails, which suggested that for something to be this widespread, it would have to be propagated using another method. As the day went on, he was able to get a sample of the malware and started to reverse engineer it a bit, only to find that it was calling out to a specific domain. That in and of itself is not unusual. Pretty frequently, malware will reach back to what is called a command and control domain, or command and control server. That's basically just a server that's owned by the attacker that can perform a multitude of functions including receiving loot, giving new instructions, and other things that would genuinely concern your cyber defense team. What was weird here was that the domain was unregistered. Every website that has a domain name, like Facebook, Google, YouTube, they all have the name registered and in control. After noting that this was unregistered, Marcus decided to register it. It's not the first time he's done something like that either, it's a pretty common thing to think about. How can you maintain leverage over a potential C2 server? If it's unregistered, you register it and you take control of that domain. Not the server itself, but you control where it's looking when that domain is looked up. So he didn't really think much of that at the time. But he was able to use some tools to detect that this attack did start around 8 a.m. London time, given the amount of queries that would be going to that domain. While that went on, he continued to look at the malware and had made the leap in his head that based off the connections he was seeing it try to make, that this could have been using the Eternal Blue exploit from a month prior. Eventually, he did what I love, which is just sourcing his information to the community at large and seeing if anyone else came to similar conclusions. Researchers at Cisco Talos wanted to try to confirm it too, so they reached out to Marcus for the sample of malware that he had. Only there was a problem. They couldn't get it to run. The exact same sample he was using was failing now for the new researchers trying to take a look at it. It turns out that Marcus had accidentally triggered a kind of kill switch for the malware when he registered that domain. To verify that that domain registration was in fact the quote kill switch here, he decided to modify his own host file so that the domain lookup would purposely fail, effectively simulating how it was before he registered it. With that set, he anxiously tried to launch the code again, and lo and behold, it worked. It turned out that the process for WannaCry to operate was something like this. Look for a domain. If it's not registered, ransom that system and spread. If it is registered, do nothing. There were a few other considerations that Marcus had voiced concerns about too. Firstly, was this the only domain? Turned out that 
yes, it was, kind of. It was the only domain for that specific instance of WannaCry. But much like another virus that I won't name, there are possible variants that might be calling out to a different domain. And it wasn't unreasonable to think that they could just change it and let it repropagate. It was critical here that systems, especially internet-facing systems, got patched immediately. If you're interested in a bit more of a technical dive of that story, Marcus wrote a great blog post titled How to Accidentally Stop Global Cyber Attacks. It's on his blog called MalwareTech.com, and it really is a great read. WannaCry didn't just stop at the NHS. It's easy to think that that's the big impact, that's the big play, but it hit a lot of other places that day as well. It kept changing, impacting more and more institutions, and all in all, it spread to more than 150 countries. And when you factor in the other companies it hit, that ransomware did around $4 billion in damages. Those damages come from things like missed services that could have made a profit, insurance paying out a ransom, equipment that might have needed to be replaced, and all the other little things that happen when you grind to a halt and need to make sure every little thing is clean. WannaCry was probably one of the first big ransomware hits to really catch the public eye, possibly because of just how far that reach went. You might think even after what I just said that the UK was the holder of the most amount of users hit by it, but it was actually Russia. It took out systems in Russia's interior ministry, its railways, banks, and even some of their cell phone providers. Here in the United States, it did damage to FedEx, causing delays in deliveries that could have totaled up to hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages. German railways saw themselves hit with it, so not only were we looking at a potential healthcare disaster in the UK here, we were looking at infrastructure problems that could have spanned the entire globe. In the transcript, I've put a screenshot of one situation where the schedule for the German rail system was cut off by the WannaCry ransom note. In South Korea, it was the cinema. One of the country's biggest cinema conglomerates said that their advertising servers were hit and it caused impacts at 50 of the cinemas that were attached to those servers. Even in China, hundreds of thousands of computers were hit with this. That spans roughly 30,000 institutions, including government agencies, hospitals, and schools. My point with all this is that something like this doesn't really know borders. It didn't stop unless that kill switch had been triggered. And even then, that didn't help all the people and organizations that were already encrypted. Each of those organizations would now have to devote time and resources into a full investigation, a full recovery, and a verification to make sure that it was out of their system once and for all. That's not a simple task, especially for organizations that place restrictions on when events like that can occur. And even after that, whatever work they had been doing was now significantly delayed, causing another loss. This is where we see that fiscal cost that isn't much talked about, all adding up in the shadows. WannaCry raised the game for security awareness. The importance of a solid patching program for your systems was critical, because while some industries watched this all unfold, scared that they might be next, the ones that had maintained a good patching cadence and good practice were able to keep up and likely avoid a major impact. It raised the standards of the security industry as a whole, which in the end would benefit programs, but at that point in time, it certainly felt a bit different. I think before this incident, there was a general attitude that something like this just wasn't likely to happen to your own organization. A little bit of a, it couldn't possibly be me, kind of thing. But WannaCry certainly knew how to humble an entire industry. And on the flip side of it, I think WannaCry also really showed the black hat hacking community how much of a profit there was to be made in ransomware. It could be pretty easy to set up, and the potential payout was pretty high. So, over the coming years, it's not surprising to see that ransomware attack vector grow in popularity. Even today, some companies don't have great patching programs and there are new versions of WannaCry that continue to operate. And all this happened so that North Korea could make some profit, right? 300,000 machines were hit, $4 billion in damages, how much money do you think they got away with? Let's start with the ransom note. We saw that they asked for payment in the amount of $300 immediately, and $600 if it doubled. All in all, they ended up with about 54 Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a bit volatile though, so let's take a look at what the potential profits could have been compared to now. At the time, if they had withdrawn it immediately, they would have had about $120,000, since Bitcoin was at about $2.2,000 per coin at that point. That year though, Bitcoin would start to take off a bit, closing the year at around $16,000 per coin. 
So if they withdrew in late September of 2017, they could have gotten around $864,000. To really showcase this volatility, let's look at the last Lazarus Group episode, which was less than a year ago, and when I did that episode, it was valued at $61,000 per coin. So two coins alone would have netted them the entirety of that attack. The whole stack, that would have fetched around $3.3 million. That brings us to today, where Bitcoin is worth, as of recording, roughly $30,000 per coin half of what it was last year. There's a lot to unpack about that in and of itself, but we won't get into that, so let's just say they'd have made out with around 1.55 million if they'd held on to it until now. And yeah, it worked, but in the end, I don't think they landed net positive because they'd get even more sanctions levied against North Korea. And as for Marcus, he continues to be a pretty prominent security researcher. He runs a site, Malware Tech, like I talked about earlier, so go take a look. In fact, I'd suggest it, because on the next episode, I'm going to tell you more about what else he's done beyond this. Because as always, there's more to the topic than just the surface level. I'm John Cordes, and thanks for listening to me explain how the shell Wanakari came to be. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. As always, if you liked it, please leave a rating or a review. Or if that's not something you really want to do, just maybe recommend it to a friend. I'm still a small show, so word of mouth goes a long way. If you want to come and talk to me directly along with some of the other fans, I've got a link to our Discord in the description and on the website. It's just a great way to give topic suggestions, talk about episodes, or even hang out. If you listened to last week's trailer, you might have heard me say that this season is going to try to take you, the listener, into consideration a bit more. The idea to do this particular episode and a Marcus Hutchins episode coming up came from my friend in the UK, Rav. So thanks for that suggestion, Rav. I know it's a bit late, but better late than never. I had a blast sitting down for this one. And lastly, like I said, I've got a store now. So if you want a sticker for your laptop, a patch for your backpack, or maybe just a t-shirt, go take a look. That's it for today. I'll see you all in two weeks for that talk about Marcus and what his career looks like, because I think it's pretty interesting.